We serve a God who has never lost a battle. We serve a God who is just as much in control today as it's always been. And we surely want to thank Sister Carol for, uh, I, I don't know, if, I know we haven't sang, thank you so very much. Um, there's a song we haven't sang in a while, If It Hadn't Been For The Lord. Um, are, are those mics still on? If it had not been on my side, Father, we bow our hearts before you today. When we look at where you brought us from, when we look at what you brought us through, every one of us could testify that we're here this morning simply because of your grace, not because of what we have done, not because of our own righteousness, but God, when we look at the battles you have won for us, when we look at the sicknesses, you have healed us from. When we look at all the things, God, we stand this morning in humility of heart, grateful for who you are. Now I pray, Almighty God, that as we stand before your people today, that God, you speak a word from your throne. I pray, God, you know the inner hearts. You know the inner issues we struggle with. God, our faces are different and so are our needs. But I pray today that you speak a word from your throne. And we pray these things, Father, in your name. Somebody give God the praise offering today. Thank you, Father. If we turn our Bibles today to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Reading from verse 17. And it reads thus. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Raphaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wouldst thou deliver them into my hands? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thy hand. And David came to Baal Perazim. And David smote them there and said, The Lord has broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim, and there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again 
and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he says, Thou shalt thou shall not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Giza, the word of the Lord. I want to talk to you this morning as you take your seat. A message in the wind. A message in the wind. A message in the wind. You know, when you, and I, I know I'm going to get in some trouble because a lot of special folks had their birthdays this week. So wherever you are, happy birthday. <laughs> there are several folks, several, but we want to celebrate the faithfulness of God. Now, it's, it's amazing because when you use the word wind, it, it, it is so accustomed. I mean, there's some things that because of their common, uh, common availability, we tend to take them for granted. So when you think about the wind, um, you don't even give it much thought um, because it's always there. And so it just um, kind of laying a foundation. The wind is a flow of gases on a large scale. And when you think on the surface of the earth, the wind consists of the bulk movement of air. Winds are commonly classified by their spatial scale, their speed, the types of forces that causes them, and the region in which they occur, and their effect. So when, when we think about the wind, uh, we think about the force around us. And for, you know, oftentimes, when you look at the technology that we have today, we tend to forget just how far we have come. There was a time when a civilization would rely on natural forces and would harness those energies into mechanical power. So we think of the windmill that would generate, generate rotational force. And, and, and so when we think about the, the, uh, whether it's a blizzard or a strong wind we call a storm or a hurricane, the idea is that the wind is always around us. Now, the, wind can all, the word wind can also be symbolized when somebody says, you're talking wind. Or what they're really saying, you're saying nothing. And, and, and so when we look even in scriptures, we think um, the, the, the word wind is, is oftentimes used in scripture, even in negative ways. In the Old Testament, wind is often used as a picture of temporary or temporality or futility. The idea is you're just passing as wind. The lens of a human life is frequently imagined as a whisper in the wind, according to Psalm 39. It's like trying to catch the wind. It's a common refrain of Ecclesiastes to point to the meaninglessness of actions. Isaiah tells us, that the people of God went through labor, but gave birth only to wind, symbolizing the futility of their actions. The wind also negatively signifies doubtfulness or uncertainty. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul speaks about believers who develop spiritual maturity as opposed to those who are tossed to and fro like the wind. Due to the potential to destroy things, winds can also be deadly. If you've ever experienced a storm, you know how wind can even redefine the landscape. And the wind can also speak of adversity. So when we talk about, I'm going through the wind of change, it means that the change is coming at such a force that it's beyond my control. But we also look in scriptures and the wind can also have some positive um, meanings because wind in the Bible 
is also connected with God's breath and his ultimate authority over the world. In Hebrew, the word for breath, ruah, also means wind. God created with the breath. God looked out in nothing and just spoke our word. And the Bible says that which was declared came into existence. In Revelations, we also see in chapter 1 and 7, it pictures the angels holding back the four winds of the earth. And throughout the New Testament, Jesus demonstrates control over the wind. We also see the most famous use of wind as a symbol representing the Holy Spirit. John states the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear a sound, but you don't know where the wind is coming from. We also see a further connection of the Holy Spirit and wind as on the day of Pentecost. The Bible says, and they were in the upper room, and they were in one accord, and there was the manifest presence of God, which like as a rushing mighty wind, it filled the house where they were. And of course, we also use the word wind in scripture as it speaks to conviction and of course, God's authority. This passage we look at today is so powerful because it speaks to us when David took the throne of Israel. If you look in chapter 1, you remember that Saul had died. They were in battle with the Philistines. And you remember how David had just defeated the, um, the, the, the Amalekites, come back in Ziglag, and while he's there, a man comes rushing in and his clothes is tattered. And David says, where are you coming from? He says, I'm just coming back from the battle. He says, Israel has been defeated by the Philistines and Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. And you remember somehow, and, and David says, how do you know that Saul is dead? And the young man says, I know he's dead. Because it just so happened, I came upon the mountain and Saul was wounded and he was wounded to death, but life was still in him and he was leaning on his spear and he's, as he was being pursued by the enemy, he looks around and he saw me and he says, young man, who are you? And he says, I'm the son of a stranger. I'm an Amalekite. He says, I'm dying. He says, Step, stand on me and kill me. The young man says to David, he says, David, I know he's dead because I stood on him and I pierced the sword through him. And he says, I knew he was dying, but uh, I, I finished him off. And I took his crown. I took the bracelet off his hand. And David, David, who had fled from Saul for how many years? David, who knew that Saul had tried to kill him, when he heard that Saul had died, he did something rather strange. He says to the men with him, he says to the young man, he says, young man, where did you come from? He says, I'm the son of a stranger. I'm the son of a, a Malachite. He says, young man, didn't you even think that you didn't have the right to touch the Lord's anointed. Even in the moment when his enemy had died, David still had a reference because he knew that God, that Saul was in God's hands. And he says to one of his young men, lean over on that young man, which really meant get close to him and kill him. And then David prayed. He says, God, shall I go up? Because David knew that he was anointed to be the next king. I want somebody to hear this. Because God knows what he has anointed you for. But there is a timing to that appointment. And so God says, David says, God, shall I go up? And God says, yes, you should go up. And he says, where should I go? He said, go up to Hebron. And David went up to Hebron. And you know that Judah, the tribe of Judah, knowing that David was 
already by God anointed to be king. They anointed him king over Judea. Bible says that Abner, the chief of staff for Saul, when he heard that Saul had died, he took Saul's son, Ishbosheth, and he set him up as king over Israel. And for a while, there were battle between the house of Saul and the house of David. Even that one day, Abner um, says to David's chief, Joab, he says, come, let's bring the young men out. And they took them, um, 12 on either side. As they stood by the pool, and as Abner is sitting there, he says, Joab, let the young men spar, let them fight. And the Bible said, 12 from the tribe of David, and 12 from the, tri the, the rest of Israel. And they, they, they had went into combat, and the Bible says they killed each other on the spot. One day, Abner showed up. As a matter of fact, I, can I, can I, I mean, there's so much, there's so much wealth in Scripture. Because the Bible says, and, and here one day that Abner um, went up to Saul's concubine, Rizpah. And when Saul's son heard that Abner, who was now becoming strong in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the house of Israel, had gone in with Saul's concubine, he says, how could you go and sleep with my father's woman? And Abner was so insulted. He says, who dare you attack me and treat me like a dog? He says, as a matter of fact, I protected you so far, but I'm going to go on the side of David and bring to pass God's will for David's life. Oh, oh my God, you understand. You don't have to worry. When God has some place for you, when God has an appointment for you, he'll make even your enemies come and bring it to pass in your life. One day Abner goes in and he visits with David with 20 of his men. And you know how David sat and he says, oh, by the way, he says, David, we know God has called you to succeed Saul. And he says, I'm going to work with you. And after they had a meal, David released him. When Joab came in a few minutes later and heard that Abner was with David, he, he went in, in David's face. He goes, do you know, do you really understand that Abner really came to check out, to see your movement? Because it, what it, his, his will is to destroy you. And without David knowing a word, Joab sent word and told Abner, come back. The king wants to talk to you. And poor Abner walks back to Hebron. And when he came in, um, Joab pulled him to the side. Say, I want to have a talk with you. And thinking he's going to have a private conversation, he pushed the sword in the side and killed him on the spot. But, but something quite interesting about David. Because David, although God had uh, anointed him years before to be king over Israel, now he was only king over Judea. The rest of the 11 tribes were under Saul's control. But when Saul and Jonathan died, David gave them a wonderful fill. I mean, look here. The men of Benjamin came out and buried them. And David says, look here. I want to honor you for how you honored your leader. And he says, the same way you respected Saul, he says, I'm going to respect you. And may God bless you. You lose nothing by blessing your enemy. You lose nothing by blessing those who despisefully use you. You lose nothing by blessing those who even may think evil of you. And here's what happens. As David honored them, the hearts of the people turned to David. When, jo when, when, when um, Joab killed Abner, here's what David did. He says, Abner, he says, um, Joab, Joab, you should not have done it. But he says to Joab, I want you to take your brethren and I want you to walk in front of this casket. I want all of my men to rip their clothes and they mourned over Abner. They mourned over Abner. And the people said, man, it wasn't David's heart to kill Abner. And the Bible says, and their hearts turned towards him. And eventually David literally became king over all. Now you know that Ishmael eventually got murdered. After he heard that Abner died, he was in his house. And, and, and two of two brothers, they went in pretending to have a discussion in the heat of the day. And, and uh, Ishmael is lying in his bed. And they killed him, cut off his head. And they traveled all night. Next day, they showed up. 
And they said, David, I want you to know we have just killed your enemy. And David says, did you hear what I did to the person who gave me news about Saul? When he thought he was going to get a reward, instead he died. And how could you go into a person's house and kill him while he's in his bed and believe I'm going to rejoice? I want the congregation to hear this because tell your neighbor we're in transition. Tell your neighbor we're in transition. And when you are in transition, just like David, who was in transition to take over the throne, when you are in transition, you have to learn the maturity of not even revenging that which had been done against you. That means as God has now put us in transition, I don't care who has uttered a negative word against the church of God of East Flatbush. I don't care who has ever uttered a negative word even against Bishop Nelson. And by the way, I'm instructing you, don't even fight for me. Just smile and say, pray for him. You don't need to fight my battles. God will fight the battle. The battle is not ours. And here's what the devil does. The devil loves to pull up an old disagreement. In that moment, when you're on the stage of promotion, in that moment when God is going to move you to a different level, the last thing you need is to fight an old battle. My God, you are moving into a different level. You're moving on a different stage. You got to let God take care of those. Stop fighting those battles which are behind you. And so here, these brothers thought that David would have rewarded them. For killing Saul's son. And you know what happens. He called his men and killed them right there. He says, I, I want to do God's business. And I don't want any innocent blood on my hands. Because you can't have innocent blood and walk into your destiny. You can't have innocent blood on your hand and think God is going to bring you to that place. And so here's what happens. Now, David has just become king. He has now brought the, the, um, the tribe of Judea and all the other tribes together. And when the Philistines heard that David had become king, the Bible says they came out and they spread. Notice the word spread. The, you know, it's, it, the scripture is very intentional. You only spread something when you have a lot of it. And the idea is, is that for us to understood, I have to, us to understand how the, the Philistines came out in such a mighty army. They had just defeated Saul. They have just killed Saul and killed Jonathan. And now they came out with a show of force. And the Bible said they spread out in the valley. There were so many. And God and David, he inquired of God. He says, God, should I go up and fight him? And God says, go up. I'm going to turn them over. And the Bible says, and David took his army, and they went down and fought the Philistines and defeated them. Can you imagine the last battle the Philistines had with Israel? They had killed Israel's king. They had killed the next in throne. But here this time, when David showed up with God is on your side, it's not a matter of how many come against you. If God is the only one standing with you, you are bound to have victory. And the Bible says... And David took his army and he went against the Philistines. And here's what happened. When they met in the valley of Raphim, the Bible says God did something. He, David testified. He says, God, this battle, this victory was like you breaking out the beach, breaking out the water. In other words, God was given such a victory that my God, David, only had to show up and he was winning the victory. He named the place Baal Perishim, the place of breakthrough. I want to say to somebody today, when the devil spread the attack, when the devil comes against you, God is the God of the breakthrough who can give you victory even in the most difficult times times and here's what the Bible says and the Bible tells us 
that just after the battle was fought, the Philistines were defeated. But don't expect where we are going. One fight will work the whole thing. You're going to have to learn to fight and fight and fight and fight again. That means after you have come through a battle and God brings you through, when there's another one comes around, don't give up, don't put down your weapon. Because here's what happened. They, they, they said the harder the battle, the greater the challenge, the sweeter the victory. What God is about to do in your life and in my life, when the, the devil is not going to take just one defeat. He's not going to take two defeats. He's not going to take three defeats. He's going to keep pressing back. But as long as you're in God's will, as long as you consult with the commander in chief who has never lost the battle, we are bound to defeat the enemy. And here's what happens. So the Philistines came back around to fight Israel. And when word came to David that the enemies have come back, David consulted God. And God says, this time, don't go up. You have to know when to go up. And you have to know when to wait. And God gave, he says unto, he says unto David, <coughs> he says, David, don't go up and fight the Philistines. He says, in this battle, you have to go around them. I want to say to somebody today, I know you have fought some battles in the past when you showed up at the front door and God gave you the victory. But here's what happens. God said, not this time. You're not going to go up and ring the doorbell. You're not going to go up on the front porch. You're going to go up around the sides and come behind them. And when you come behind them, you wait. And the Bible says, God says to David, don't go up to fight them. Go around them, circle around to the back. And he says, David, when you hear the sound of the shaking in the top of the mulberry trees, he says that it is a sign, the first thing that God wants us to understand. That the wind was a sign to David that God's presence was with him. Hear me today, church. You're not fighting by yourself. I don't care how much and how hard the battle is. Hear me today that God wants you to know you're not alone. He says when you hear the sound in the top of the mulberry tree, it is a sign I am here. And if I am if I am that I am is with you, you have already won the battle. My God, I feel the presence of the Lord in the house of the Lord because two are happened. You see what happens is we have fought some battles and we have gone to some places. But I'm here to say what God has for you. He says, don't go, don't fight it as you have done in the past. He says, you're going to take my instruction. He says, don't attack. Circle behind them and wait for the sound. My God, you got to hear the sound of the Spirit. Sometimes it's not a sound you hear in your natural hearing. You got to discern in the Spirit a sound that says God is here. And when God shows up, it's always a place to break through. When God's presence shows up, it's not what's going to happen tomorrow. It's what's going to happen right now. I want to say to somebody, God's presence is right here, right now. And what God has for you, you don't have to wait for tomorrow. You don't have to wait for next week. You can, you can stir and this receive God's grace. Go to, go to the So here's what happens. So the wind. <laughs> I want you to understand that there's a sound. That there's a sound. That there's a sound that you can't hear, so you naturally hear. 
there is a sound of the heavenlies that God is directing at his people. And he says, when you hear the sound, now here's what happens. I, I, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that. Because there are some sounds that are right now going right through this house that you can't hear. If you've ever lived with someone who has an earring impairment. <clears throat> Some people, they have for them to understand what you're saying, they have to watch your lips. Because they can, and, and you know, specialist says that when one of those sensory skills are impaired, you tend to overcompensate in the other area. So that's why blind folks who can't read can develop such capacity for memory because they don't have the luxury of saying, I'll read it next week. When you can just read it, you don't have to memorize it. How many of you can remember five telephone numbers? You got to go on your phone to, to even call your kids. You don't even remember their names. But when you didn't have iPhones, when you didn't have all these numbers, you had to hold it in your head. You had to memorize it. What well, I'm here to say to somebody today, that God is turning up your sensory, your, your auditory, spiritual capacity. So you don't need a lot of noise before you discern God's presence. Some of us are still culturally restricted. That believe God only shows up in one way. But I've come to realize even in a quiet service, even in a quiet moment, my God, talk to Elijah. You realize sometimes God shows up in the noise, but sometimes he shows up with a still, small voice. It's a reminder to somebody today that where God has taken you, you can't go by just the natural. You got to go by the spiritual. And when God speaks in the spirit, here's what happens. You can discern his presence. But you see what happens is when the noise starts, when the treetops start blowing, it's also an alarm to the enemy. The only problem is they don't understand what the noise means. In their mind, they thought it was natural. I am sure they had heard it before. But what they didn't understand this time, what used to be natural, is now a, sig a spiritual declaration that God is in the house. And when God is in the house, when God shows up, we can be ready for what he has. And notice what happens. He said, when God is speaking in your spirit, you have to learn to stand still. Some of us move too quickly. And I, I know even when we want to do good, even when we want to do good for God, we have to learn to discern timing. So the first thing we need to understand is that the wind on the top of the trees disclose God's presence. But the second thing we want to understand is that when the sound on the top of the trees began to blow, it was also a reminder. It was a definition of God's promise. I want us to walk this through one more time. Because when God makes a promise to you, and he gives you, so when you see this sign, it is a reminder of what I said before. So that means when you see the sign, it's not about the sign, it's about the promise. And so here is what, oh my God. I, you see the whole idea, the promise of Pentecost was never about tongues. The promise of Pentecost was about power. And here's what happens when God wants us to know. He, he says, now the wind is a sign of my presence but it's also coming as a sign of my promises coming to pass. Where well, here's what amazes me. And God wants me to remind you this morning that when the people of God and God move together, here's what happens, folks. The devil will do everything possible to throw us out of timing. Now, I am not a mechanic by any means of the imagination. 
I used to be able to change the oil until you buy one of those computerized cards. But here's what happens. There's something about timing that says when the timing is off, you're still moving, but out of sync. And God says, where I'm taking you, you and I have got to be in sync. Now, now, when God gave Israel the opportunity to defeat Jericho, he said, tell the people to walk around Jericho once. Now, if we were to begin to walk around, God said, walk around this building one time. As soon as we finish the circumference, there are some of us. I wasn't going to say it that way. Some of us have good intentions, but we don't understand the power of tithing. So God says to Joshua, tell the people, march one time around the city once for six days. On the seventh day, walk seven times. Here's what happens. And it's, it's as I was meditating on this word that God began to speak to my heart. That as the people walked and completed the march. Come again, march one more time. Come back out, march again. You know what was really going on? As they were walking in formation, they were falling in line. Here's what happens. Sometimes God allows us to walk longer than we have to walk just to get us in alignment. Here is what happens, Church of God of East Flatbush. We have to remind ourselves we are not three different churches. We are not four different churches. We are one church. Our destiny is tied in together. Our future is tied in together. And the idea is as we learn to walk in timing, then God will bring some things to pass that he will, here's right, he will bring to pass the promise we have been waiting for. Now, I don't know why they waited 10 days in the upper room. The Holy Spirit could have come day one. Holy Spirit could have fallen day five. But God allows us to stay in the same cycle until we fall in line with our timing. And when you put faith... In God, you know what happens. Now here, <laughs> okay, let's go to the, and so here's what happens. The wind on top of the treetops signified God's presence, but it also defined God's promise. He says, victory is yours if you do it my way. And if you're doing it God's way, victory will be yours because God is true to his promise. He's not a man. He cannot lie. And he says, if you do it this way and you do it, he's promised. He is bound to bring victory. But here's what happens. The wind on top of the treetops also displayed God's power. When the wind begins to blow, it is not the time for you to resign. It's not the time for you to give up. It is not the time for you to walk away. Here's what happens is I have learned to understand the power of the wind. Because even though you can't control the wind, God walks on the top of the wind. My God, he just shows up. You remember when Jesus and the disciples, as you actually the disciples were out sailing all night, Caught in the storm, and they saw somebody walking on top of the waves. And one of them said, It must be it must be a ghost, it must be a Caribbean person. Everything you don't understand has got to be a ghost. And then they rec they heard a voice when Jesus declared his presence. Here's what happens: when the winds of adversity are blowing against you. And it feels like everything you hold on to is falling apart. Learn to trust God and watch his power displayed. So in Mark, 
the Bible says in Mark, God says to his disciples, he says, let's go over on the other side. Jesus goes into the, in the boat with his disciples and he says, let us go over to the other side. Where were they headed for? The other side. Somewhere in the middle, he fell asleep. Somewhere in the middle, he's lying there totally relaxed. And the Bible says a storm rose up. And the disciples begin to roll harder. And they begin to panic. And they thought, man, they're going to die because they forgot what he said. He says, let us go unto the other side. And if God said, we're going to the other side, honey, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what storms come against you. If God says we're going to the other side, then that's exactly where you and I are going. And the Bible says, as they are sailing, they came across a storm. And you know what happens. They start panicking. And somebody goes, where's Jesus? How can you sleep when our lives are in jeopardy? Somebody goes down, wakes him up. Lord, how can you be down here sleeping when our lives are in jeopardy? And Jesus walks up, looks out, and he says, peace be still. They said, how could this be? What, who is really on board with us? Because you don't understand the power of God until he stills your storm. Now, all you and I have to do is to look back and remember that God would use the wind to come to your deliverance. You remember when Noah built the ark? And God raised up the flood. Remember, go back one, one of that one. You have me. You remember when God plagued the Egyptians? He would have the wind to blow the plagues, whether it be lice, whatever. You remember when they came to the Red Sea? It was the wind that blew the waters to divide. Remember when the children of Israel were walking out in the wilderness and they started complaining? We have had a good meal of chicken for a while. And the Bible says, and the Lord caused the wind to blow the quails. And you know where the quails came? Just where they are. I want to say to somebody, this, there is the power of God over the wind. And he can blow he, whatever he allows to blow against you. He can preserve you in the midst of that situation. And know that when the breakthrough comes, he can blow it all the way. So here's what happens. The wind on the top of the treetop symbolized, it declared to us the presence of God. It was, a, it was a reminder that it was a presence of God. But it also defined the promise of God when he says, when you hear the wind, step up. Now, here's what happens. It's his deliverance also shows the display. Here's what happens. I've come to realize that sometimes you're going through a situation and many times you believe God has forgotten you. And what you don't recognize is that God is displaying a sermon to somebody else. I want you to hold on that one. So, so here's what happened. So you may be at work and you may be mistreated in whatever situation. And the devil tells you, defend yourself. And the Holy Spirit says, stand still and let God handle this. And here's what happens is, by just your demeanor, you are preaching. Here's what happens. We are now in a new reality called COVID-19. I mean, I haven't seen your lips for weeks. Because every time I see you, you are behind the mask. So that means even when you speak, it is muffled. So your greatest sermon, your greatest testimony is not what you say. It's how you live before others. And sometimes God, when he allows you to go through trouble, it's really a sermon to somebody else. You don't believe me? Ask Paul. Because the Bible says that when they were killing, when they were murdering, 
Stephen. And they were throwing stones at Paul, at Stephen. Paul wasn't throwing any stones. But he was standing there watching how this godly man reacted when he was under attack. And I want to say to the church, if you're waiting to go over to Ebenezer to articulate your sermon, you have a long time coming. Your greatest sermon is not what you proclaim from your lips. It's how you conduct yourself when things are not going your way. And so Paul was able to look at Stephen and say, because of the way this man conducted himself, he spoke to him about his faith. But also remember, the wind is one of the ways God used to develop his people. You and I will never develop muscles, spiritual muscles, under holidays. He will, you and I will not develop our greatest spiritual muscle during times of calm. It is in time of adversity that you and I develop our faith. Now, there's an old English word that the King James Version used. It's called bestir. Bestir. Sounds very King james Bestir. What it really means is move. Because what happens is when the wind blows, it's not the time to contemplate. When the wind begins to blow, it's not the time for you to debate. When the wind begins to blow, it's decisive time. And here's what happens. Indecision has caused a lot of shipwreck in the church. So sometimes you and I can sit and look at other people who you and I think are less capable, less mature, less competent, but because of their decisiveness, their willingness to move in an opportunity of growth. I remember we had, a, when we were in Cleveland as students, and I remember Di was working at the library. And for a, a wonderful sum of, I think, $3 something per hour. Am I right? And three ninety five per hour, and that was like nineteen eighty five, eighty six, eighty six, eighty seven, and for a wonderful sum of three ninety five per hour working in the library, and we have, we there's another couple that we were very good friends. We would do a lot of stuff together, and and our our friend who's now deceased. She was also working in the library before it died, and she probably was being paid about $4 an hour. And, and, and so a, a position came up, and we said to her, apply. And she goes, no, Hugh, if my, um, the supervisor, the director for the library, she says, if the director had wanted me to apply, she would have told me to. She was making like $4 an hour. And we are like, Monica, apply for the job and let them turn you down. And she gave every reason why she didn't believe she would have gotten the job. And uh, there was a guy who had joined the staff about four months before. And she trained him in everything he was doing. And here's what happens. He applied for the job. And one day she came by the house and she pulled up and she's upset. And we're like, what's going on? You're not usually upset. And she goes, can you believe? Do you know who they gave the job? And she began to talk about this guy and talked about every defect and every reason why he was not qualified. And I asked her one simple question. I said, Monica, did you apply? She says, no. I said, if you didn't apply, you don't have a reason to complain. Let me say to the church today, a lot of us have missed wonderful opportunities because we were indecisive. Now, indecision is not a sin. It's a human frailty. But what you learn in life 
you will never always be 25 years old. You will never always be 30 years old. You will never always be 40 years old. And when God gives a window of opportunity, you have to learn to step on board. My father always says, Hugh, it is better for you, it is better for you to prepare for an opportunity you have never had than to get an opportunity you were not prepared for. The idea is God will give you what you're prepared for, not what you want. And so in this season of COVID-19, when everyone is saying, pull back, mask up, and hold the fort, God says to tell the church of God of East Flatbush that he is not finished with us yet, and our destiny is not at the mercy of COVID-19. And he says, if you will take my word and will be decisive with my word, he says, I will do something that when you look back, it would seem impossible. Let me tell you something. Even in COVID-19, there are some awesome opportunities. I know there's a lot of stuff we are not able to do, but there are a lot of things, folks, that you and I can do. And God is still opening doors. God is still making a way. God is still giving opportunities. Don't wait until COVID is over. Don't wait until we move to a post-COVID age before you become decisive. Right now can be be your breakthrough right now can be your bail perishing moment right now can be the breakthrough here's what happened God wants us to break out of the old mindset you got to look at some things you have always done and say this time we need to shift our mindset we got to break out from our old defeats I don't care how you were defeated last year I don't care where the devil defeated you in February you got to say to the devil it is October 2020. It's not yet over. And if God says he's going to do it for you in 2020, until the 30th, the 31st of December, you still have a window of opportunity. Be decisive. Step out and believe God to do the impossible. It is time to break out of toxic relationships. If those relationships don't stir your growth, it's time to break out. If those relationships relationships don't build your faith, it's time to break out. If those relationships don't cause you to become more discerning spiritually, it's time to break out. It is time to break out of the cycle of poverty. I want you to know in the midst of COVID-19, you can still have a breakthrough. You can still break out of poverty because your resource is not dependent on your workplace. Your resource is dependent on the God who walks upon the winds of the morning. And if he says to you this morning that when you hear the wind, then you need to recognize my presence. You need to rec remember my promises. You need to look at my power on display. But when you hear the wind, it's time to grow up and mature. And stop looking backwards. Embrace the moment and defeat the enemy facing you today. I want us to stand this morning. I don't know what winds are blowing against you today. Oftentimes, we spend more time criticizing each other than praying for each other. And I want to invite us today, if you're here in the house, if you're there watching on live stream, and you're facing adverse winds this morning, just raise your hands. Just raise your hands. We want to pray for you. Because I want you to know there is a message in the wind. That message is for you 
to attack differently. That message is for you to recognize that the ultimate victory in that battle is not in your hands, it is in God's hands. And even in the adversity of your situation, God says, I want to give you a breakthrough. As we go before the Lord in prayer, I'm going to invite the church to join in prayer. I see your hands. You can lower your hands if you're here this morning. And you say, Pastor, I need to get back in my relationship with God. Sometimes adversity becomes your greatest blessing. I, 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 I know this is, this is strange. Like I said earlier, this is, a, this is a time we have never seen before. But think about it. If you didn't want to come to church today, you have a good excuse. If you didn't want to be in the house to worship, you actually had to register to be in the house. This feels like school. And after you registered, you also had to line up and have someone test your temperature. That means if your temperature was a little high, we would tell you to go home. But you came anyhow because you need a word from God. And not just a word from God, you need an encounter with God. And if you're here this morning, I, 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 want, I, I know because the devil has been working over time to just pick off folks. This is a season where your faith is now being tested. That means if you don't miss church, maybe a sign something is wrong. If you don't miss the fellowship of the brethren, it says something about your walk. If you are comfortable going to work, riding on the subway, doing all your recreational activities, but then when church time comes, you go, no, 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 I don't want to go to church. I don't want to um, get anything. All of these merely reveals where we are with God. And I want to pray. I want us to go into a time of prayer as a congregation. Because in this season, God is calling us to pray for each other in a way we have never done before. You and I, God is calling us to pray for each other with a level of intensity that says, if your welfare was in that person's hands, what would they need? And here's what happens. When you see how much we depend on each other, you pray for folks differently. So I'm inviting us at this time. You see the hands which were raised. We know that many, their faiths were already weak. And the devil is taking advantage of their weak faith. Some already struggled with anxiety. And the devil is using their anxiety to isolate them. And we're going to pray this morning that there will be a sound even in the midst of COVID that reminds us of God's presence, reminds us of God's promises, reminds us of God's power, and reminds us that even in the times of adverse moments, God still wants to develop our faith. Would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father, we humble our hearts before you today. We confess, Lord, we are weak, but you are strong. God, we confess that there are some battles that we have lost. But this morning, as we face another battle, you directed David. There's a battle to go up to, and there's a battle to circumvent. And you said, this battle, you won't go up in the front. You're going to take it on from the back door. And I pray, God, for our brothers and sisters who are in the middle of a battle right now. 
God, regardless of whatever nature the battle may take. Father, I pray that you will speak to their hearts and cause them to discern the sound from heaven. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you will strengthen their faith. I pray that you will strengthen their resolve. I pray that you'll remind them your words say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you even in the times of trouble. This morning I pray, God, where the devil has used even minor disagreements or minor inconveniences to distract us from hearing the sound, I pray, Father, let there be an amplification in our ears. God, cause us in the noise around us to hear the still small voice. I ask and pray that God will encourage discouraged hearts. That those who feel as if they're in a hopeless situation. That this morning that God will speak fresh hope in their lives. And that you will give grace. Grace for this moment. And grace to be decisive. Even in the midst of the battle. May we hear the sound. And give us grace. To move. As you have directed us. I pray for that soul that has wandered. I pray for that person Lord. Who once walked with you, but this morning, somehow, they no longer hear the spiritual sound. This morning, I ask, touch, do a touch, do a work in our spiritual ears, so that we might hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I don't. Feel no waste time, oh Lord, I've come too far from where I've started from, oh, nobody told me the road. He's brought me this far. Sing it one more time. Sing it one more time. Don't feel no waste time. Oh, Lord. I've come too far from where I start. Nobody told me. Nobody told me the road would be easy. And I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave. God is speaking to my heart. Someone in the house this morning is right in the midst of making a crucial decision. God says to tell you, I have heard your prayers. I have seen the tears that you have shed. Today, I'm going to confirm my direction in your life. That you'll be able to respond in a decisive way. Yes, your indecision was not because of disobedience, merely because of uncertainty. But today, I'm going to speak at a level that you will discern a clear next step for your life. Say the Lord, God, I thank you for your words. I thank you, O oh God, for you are the God who speaks and you're the God who reveals and you're the God who directs. Even in moments of confusion, we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, you may be seated.